Here are two words you don't often hear together. Ballet and activism. But it's 2021, and the dance world, like so many industries, is having to reckon with its established culture. The Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements have focused attention, and people may feel able to discuss historic and current abuses in the profession. These are difficult conversations, and one of the most eloquent voices leading those conversations belongs to my guest today. Phil Chan. I'm David Jays, and this is Why Dance Matters, a podcast from the Royal Academy of Dance about how dance impacts upon the world. Phil Chan is a former dancer and arts advocate in New York. With Georgina Paskogin of New York City Ballet, he co-founded Final Bow for Yellowface in 2017. Provoked by stereotypes of Asian cultures and characters in classic ballets, including the much-loved Nutcracker, their campaign produced an organisation, a pledge for artistic directors to sign, and a book by Phil, also called Final Bow for Yellowface, which is both a record of what they've already achieved and a set of resources for companies striving for change. Our conversation today touches on racist slurs and stereotypes and on hate crimes. Like many organisations, the RAD is rethinking and restating its principles. So I want to ask Phil about his journey through those difficult conversations. And I especially hope to ask him what meaningful change looks like and how we can make it happen. Let's find out. Phil, it's so good to have you on Why Dance Matters. Thank you for joining us. My absolute pleasure, David. Thank you. So dance training is something that can take you in all kinds of directions. But did you expect it to lead you into activism? Absolutely not. This was not part of the plan. I think this particular brand of activism called to us, uh, both my co-founder Georgina Pazgogan and I. We were sort of in the right place at the right time, and we realized that we could make a difference just based on who we were and where we were and you know what was happening in the world. And it was a decision of we can either just let a small change happen and be glad for that, or we could make an even bigger change with the start of the conversation that we had with Peter Martin. So it just seemed like when given the choice, we just had to go for it. It sort of chooses you like dance chooses you. And how did dance choose you? Because you were born in Hong Kong. You grew up there for your first 10 years, I think. And is that yeah. is that where dance entered your life? Yeah. So I was a little boy with lots of energy, you know, bouncing off the walls. And my mother was flying back from the United States back to Hong Kong. And she was sitting next to a dancer from the Hong Kong Ballet, and their flight ended up having to stop in Tokyo overnight. And so she said, well, I'm married, you're gay, let's get a hotel room, and you know, we'll get on the next flight to Hong Kong in the morning. And they stayed up all night, and they became fast friends. And so growing up, I used to go to the ballet and see Dancer Dawn. As a little boy with lots of energy, I was driving my mom absolutely bonkers, and you know, she was complaining to her friend, and, and he said, well, why don't you put him in dance classes? And that was it. And what was it about ballet that captured your imagination? I liked the the structure. I liked having the sort of concrete order of things and just knowing that I could have a framework to work within and then find freedom within that. I think at a very young age, it was a place for me to feel strong and in control of my body and to also be able to express things that I wasn't able to put into words just yet, but also just the colorful productions. I mean, there was just so much potential for telling beautiful stories and costumes and lots of different rich characters that were possible that you didn't necessarily need words for. You could build a whole personality with just your body. And I, there was something really magical about that. To whiz you forward, you were a dancer, you worked in arts management and advocacy, but what was the spur for you and Georgina Pascogin to start Final Bow for Yellowface? 
Yeah, so Gina is on a diversity committee at New York City Ballet, and one of the things that came up was the second act of The Nutcracker. And Peter Martins, who is the artistic director at the time, basically was having a hard time figuring out what to do with with the ballet. On one hand, he had been receiving you know thousands of letters from audience members saying, I'm really not comfortable with how the different cultures are represented in the second act. I'm not comfortable bringing my children to the Nutcracker anymore. And, and you know, if children can't come to the Nutcracker, that's a really bad sign. But also he felt like he couldn't change balance sheet. You know, who was he to edit the work of a genius. You know, that wasn't really his job as the artistic director of New York City Ballet. It was really his job to be conservative and to keep it as is and unchanged for future generations. So he was really felt like he was in a predicament. And so he called me as, as a dancer, as someone who knows the choreography, but also as somebody who has a lived experience as a Chinese person in the world to talk about how the dance lands with someone like me. So he called me to his office and we met for about 45 minutes. And we talked about the history of how Asians have been represented in society, you know, in political cartoons, in in radio, in television, in movies. And then we also talked about the history of the ballet itself and, you know, where it came from, what the point of the ballet was. And then just looking at those two things, we looked at three different areas of the dance, the makeup, the choreography, and the costuming. Just for anyone who doesn't know what the common version of the Nutcracker is, what Balanchine's version is. Could you just describe what people might see in the tea dance? Sure. So the tea dance, and actually it's it's probably one of the less offensive ones. Uh, you guys have got some pretty wild ones in the UK, let me just say. But pretty much it's two women usually white women with who are made up to look Asian. So they have these sort of big geisha wigs and, you know, their eyes are drawn out um, and they push out a box, um, you know, and they, it's sort of like a little vaudeville moment, like what's in the box, what's in the box. And then out of the box pops out a male dancer who looks essentially like a Chinese coolie. Like he looks like somebody who would have built the the transcontinental railroad in the 1830s. He's got a rice paddy hat on. He's got a long Q hairstyle. He's got a Fu Manchu mustache. His eyes are painted out to his ears. And he just sort of, you know, bops around and, and there's there's a lot of shuffling and he does some big jumps and then you know, he pops back into the box at the end, and then the two ladies end by jumping onto the box and sort of sitting on there, and he's back in the box. And then they wheel him off stage. So just sort of wondering for me as a as a young person, like, wow, there's 5,000 years of Chinese history and culture to draw from. And why did we choose this sort of dirty, low-class railroad worker as the representation of Chinese? Like, couldn't there be something better? Sure. And that was the question that, that we asked. And it wasn't just you asking, as you say, you were first brought in to have that conversation with Peter Martins from New York City Ballet because audiences had been increasingly growing uncomfortable and it hadn't been sitting right with them. Right. Yeah. I mean, Peter said literally thousands of letters uh, that the company had received talking about this issue before you know they took action. So I left that meeting and I called Gina and I said, you know, I, I think Peter Martins is going to change the Nutcracker. And, and that's, I guess, when we realized where the advocacy really stepped in and we said, okay, well, this could either be like, you know, a nice pat on the back for New York City Ballet and we could go back to our daily lives and our day jobs. Or we looked across the entire dance landscape and we realized that like everybody was doing kind of a slightly offensive Chinese dance in their nutcracker. So if Peter Martins at New York City Ballet was willing to change, why not every company in the country? And so, you know, that's when we decided that, okay, there's the potential here to update the standard of this dance for everybody. And we wanted to do it in a way that was constructive and not necessarily, you know, sort of call out cancel culture. Because you know what happens if somebody calls you racist, David, you know, if, if, if you came to me and said, hey, Phil, your new ballet's racist, you're racist. I'd say, well, no, I'm not. My, my cousin's black. I lived in Japan for five years and I love Mexican food. I'm not racist. And that's, that's the end of the conversation, right? We can't really have anything constructive when that's the tone. Whereas instead, if you had come to me and said, hey, you know, the Chinese dancer in your new ballet, it's, it's, he's sort of the butt of the joke a lot. Was that your intention? Is that the point of that character? And then I'd say, well, no, I, I didn't even read it that way. That, that wasn't how it was coming across to me. And, and that's not how I want the audience to get it. So how can we change it so that that's not 
the impact that's happening on the audience. So it's in that space that we can actually have a constructive conversation. And then it becomes the question of what's good art as opposed to what's offensive or what's racist or not. So that's really been our tone since the very beginning. And also I think it's made a difference because we are ballet people, right? Like we love ballet. And then actually the first line of our pledge says, I love ballet. So we didn't necessarily have to be angry or get a big public social media campaign to take down companies because we already knew all of the gatekeepers, all of the artistic directors who were in a position to make positive change. So we didn't have to be loud and angry in that same way. It's interesting reading uh, your book, Final Bow for Yellowface, because you describe how you reach out to leading companies all over the US and, and beyond to talk about their nutcrackers and other ballets that they do. And one of the things that really struck me was how polite you worked to remain. And you've just described very beautifully why, to make sure you concentrate on impact rather than intention. But I did wonder, what was the emotional toll of having to manage those difficult conversations and keep them on that calm, constructive level? Well, I think for us, there really is no other way, you know, and that's what we kept reminding ourselves. So yes, it is exhausting and it is hard to stay calm, especially when there are a lot of feelings <laughs> associated with this work, but just realizing that it doesn't work. The work doesn't happen if you get angry, if you get loud. It's it's almost like if you are able to stay calm and, and just state out the facts, it's easier for people to listen to you. So I think that has been a consistent thing that, that has driven our advocacy and sort of kept us staying cool. And, and like you mentioned, the subtitle of my book is Dancing Between Intention and Impact. And when you can focus on that instead of you know the problems, it's a lot easier to do this work in a creative way, in a joyful way, in a playful way, in a fun way, because ultimately like this is creative work and you have to be open-minded in order to be creative. So I think that's just been a constant reminder for us. You know, we recently had an uptick in, in anti-Asian attacks, at least here in the United States, and I know in the UK as well, as a result of COVID, that has taken on sort of a larger urgency and a bigger emotional toll. We had a horrific shooting in Atlanta here in the US, and following that shooting, we pretty much became the emotional epicenter for the Asian dance community here in the US. And people were finally connecting the dots between our work and our advocacy of how do we represent Asians on stage and then how do we treat them outside in society as well. So if we only have two-dimensional portrayals of Asians or, you know, not nuanced portrayals. It's really easy then to go out on the street and, and spit on Asian people or not really see them as fully human. So that has been a real connection that we've made since the very beginning. It was very sad that it took something so horrific as like a mass shooting for people to really connect those dots. That's at the heart of why this work is so important to us is because if we can improve how Asians are represented on stage, maybe we'll treat them better off stage as well. And that connection had always been clear to you from the beginning. Right. As an Asian person with lived experience as an Asian person, that's always been very clear. And, and really it's for us, it's not about the makeup. You know, it's not about the shuffling and the head bobbing. It's about how we're treated outside in the studio as well and how if our art is supposed to be a mirror to our our, our world and our experiences, you know, this is a funhouse mirror that distorts Asian people. And we can do better, especially when Asians don't have a big choreographic voice in the community as well. It's primarily all of these depictions of Asians have been Eurocentric, have been defined by European and white people, you know, over 400 years. So actually finding opportunities to let people of Asian descent make work on their own terms and represent themselves, I think is sort of the next phase of our advocacy. Because these Western fantasies about the Orient, which are often picturesque, but equally often about sex, about desire, about violence. And they lurk in classic ballets, La Bayadere, Le Corsaire, and all sorts of movies, all sorts of operas, everywhere in our culture. 
And I'm wondering, how do we rewrite those fantasies into something that feels more like an inclusive reality? I just finished a fellowship with the New York Public Library, where I looked at 100 different Orientalist ballets from you know the 1700s, Versailles, all the way to today, 2021. This is sort of the subject of my next book, so spoiler alert. <laughs> but what I, what I found was that Orientalism as a device, I was sort of asking, like, what is it for? Who is telling Orientalist stories? Why do we do it? Why is it attractive? Because it's, you know, there's a 400 year history of us doing this work. And so why is it so popular? And why can we not let this go? And what I found was, if you look at how ballet has evolved, it's been influenced by Spanish dance, it's been influenced by Russian folk dance. But you know, when it comes to Arabian and Chinese, there really hasn't been much input of Arabian culture or Chinese dance into classical ballet. What do we see when we see an Asian dance on stage? What we see is a European person who doesn't quite have all the facts, and then they just have to fill in the, the gaps with imagination. The thrust of my next book is that Orientalism is probably the greatest internal driver of creativity and innovation in classical ballet and, and many European performing arts. Because, you know, if you don't have all the pieces, if you don't really know any Chinese people or know what Chinese dance looks like, you just have to make it up. You have to use your imagination. So I guess the process was, well, if we Europeans point our toes, then maybe you Orientals flex your feet. If we dance the minuet and the polka and the, the gavotte and, you know, three, four, four, four time signature. Maybe Orientals do five, four or some other exotic time signature. And then a generation later, you know, artists like Balanchine say, oh, flexed feet, let's make that art. Let's just put that into regular dances. Or Stravinsky would say, oh, look at these weird, funky time signatures. Let's just make that music. And so using your imagination, Orientalism has been a great vessel for that. And the problem is that we have these Orientalist masterpieces like Le Bayadair. We keep performing them as is because tradition. And then suddenly now we're saying, oh, we want more diversity. We want to be more inclusive. Yes, we want Asian people to come in and join our boards and enroll their students and become ticket buyers. So please come on in, Asian people. But here's this fantasy of your culture that has nothing to do with you, that pretends to be about you, that we're still performing because it's a masterpiece and we're sorry if you're upset, but please give us your money. I don't think that works anymore. Like, I don't think those two things are congruent. So the bigger question that our work has raised is how do we keep tradition while being inclusive to people who are not part of that original history? And so I'm, I'm actually working on two new versions of Le Bayadere and of Le Corsaire, both very popular 19th century ballets still today in the 21st century. But how do we replace the European center of this work, the European, exclusively European gaze from these works with a multiracial lens? So when we think about what is a multiracial lens, it doesn't mean get rid of Europeanness or white people. White people are included in a multiracial lens, but so is everybody else. So when you look at Bayadere, which is a fantasy about India, and then you ask an Indian person, you know, is this an accurate fantasy? And it's it's not for them. And it's not abstract. And it's it's very much a real thing. How do we keep Le Bayadere and all of the, the classical choreography, the musicality, the structure of this grand Russian spectacle, but be inclusive to people of color? And I, I don't think we can just, you know, cancel the Nutcracker and get rid of Bayadere because as a dancer... There's so much richness in these works, and you really need that foundation in order to know where we've come from so you can push the art form forward. So as a choreographer, I'm very interested in keeping some of these masterworks alive, but maybe not in the way that they were originally made. So if you look at opera and theater, Shakespeare, for example, has been lots of different settings for Shakespeare that were not original. And why is it okay? People are comfortable with that because there's always the text to fall back on, right? There's always Shakespeare's words. You, you can't change Shakespeare's words. So you can make A Midsummer Night's Dream as a classical version, you know, traditional set and period. You can set Midsummer Night's Dream underwater or on the moon or, you know, wherever, countless other places. But there's always that text to remind you. Similarly with opera, you know, you can set La Boheme in many different settings. And there's always the beautiful Puccini music. So it, it, it's not as scary to, to change that. But with ballet, it seems like 
it's not written down in the same way, or the notation is difficult. It's expensive. Not everything has been notated, and it, it really still is an, an oral tradition where it's one dancer passing it down to the next. And dance is disintegrating in our hands as soon as we touch it. You know, it's so fragile. As soon as that curtain goes down, it's a different show. And so, how do we keep our history unless we hold it super tight? And so, thinking about that, I'm going back to the notation. I'm working with uh, Doug Fullington, who's a brilliant dance scholar and musicologist out of Seattle. And we're actually going back to the original notations. We're even staging some dances that haven't been seen in the West. But we're changing the context of how those dances are served to the audience. So, if you look at Creole Giselle, which Dance Theatre of Harlem did, keeps the choreography of Giselle, but it, instead of it being about a sort of an Austrian peasant girl, it becomes a black woman, about a black woman in Louisiana. So it's making it about us instead of them, you know, those people over there. So that same process with Bayadair, it's an Eastern fantasy. How do we make the fantasy about us? What is a fantasy we have about ourselves? And so we've decided to stage our Bayadair during the golden age of movie making, and it's going to be set at a dude ranch, so cowboys. Um, and that's sort of a, a, a Western fantasy. So you, in the original, you have um, you know the Dance of the Veils. You have these bayadaires come out, and they have these silk scarves, and it's you know this kind of a hoochie-coochie dance. In our version, they're filming a country Western movie. And so it's uh, cowgirls with lassos. Same choreography. And instead of character shoes, they're going to have cowgirl boots. But of you know, it, it, that also works. So we're not taking away any of the choreography, but instead we're replacing a formerly Eurocentric ballet with a multiracial center so that anybody can see themselves in these roles. It can be performed by multiracial companies for a diverse audience. And I think that's the way we keep tradition alive and change in our art form happens all the time. You know, the black swan in Swan Lake, well, originally she wore a canary yellow tutu and then it was red for a while. And then someone said, oh, let's make it the same dancer. Yeah. You know, the same ballerina who performs both roles and legs have gotten higher and there's more turns now. And so it's like these ballets have changed so much since the original and they're changing all the time and they will change. So if we're changing some things about ballets, why can't we change how we portray people of color as well? What difference does it make to dancers if they can dance something that they don't have to apologise for? I think it's especially uncomfortable for dancers of color to be put in these roles where they have to almost play their own cultures, but in a, like a super stylized way that doesn't ring true to them. It just reinforces that you don't belong and that you're not the center of the story and that you're the window dressing. That's an uncomfortable place to be as a dancer, as an artist, if you're trying to find depth in your character, uh, but then be given sort of a two-dimensional caricature instead. It questions the integrity of, of you as an artist and it makes it really hard to do the work as opposed to being able to approach it in a creative way in an open way and to find depth in the roles you're dancing it just makes it really hard when the role you're dancing is just a flattened racial slur yeah and i know you're going to be discussing some of the ideas in your work in an online symposium held by the rad later this year in july 2021. It's open to everyone, but a lot of the people listening will be dance teachers. So I'm wondering, how can they take on those ideas to make their own classes more welcoming, more inclusive? Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, I wrote a book, Final Bow for Yellow Face, about how to deal with some of these issues. I also have a teaching guide for the book that, that accompanies it. So if there's any teachers out there who are listening who would like a copy of that, just send me an email. It's really questioning this process. You have to question everything you're doing, like the, well, this is how it's done. This is how we've always done it. Um, it's questioning that. It's questioning the assumptions that we hold. Why do we do things this way? Why Why is this the tradition? And, and sometimes there's a very good answer for it. And sometimes there's not. It's just, it's, it is this way because that's how it's always been. And so in those contexts, there is room for change. There is room for growth. There is room to make ballet bigger. And I think that's essentially why we're doing this is to make ballet bigger. So it's not just for a select few people but it's for 
for everybody. And that's the only way I think ballet is going to survive. So as teachers, if you want to have a diverse classroom, if you want to have parents, faculty, a community that is diverse, you really have to engage in this work. And that means the that letting your dancers of color wear tights that match their skin tone so that their natural lines can show through. It means questioning the repertory choices. So yeah, how do we do the work on stage? How do we portray other cultures on our stages? Who's involved in making those creative decisions? Who has a voice? Questioning those things will help make your studio, your, your school more inclusive. One thing we haven't really said is how quickly a uh, final bow for yellow face has achieved so much. I and mean, your initial conversation with New York City Ballet was only what three years ago? It was five five, five. years ago. So oh, this is our okay. fifth fifth anniversary this year. Five years feels like a long time <laughs> in the life of an individual person. Yeah. But in terms of change and advocacy, five years is not a lot of time. This change happened very quickly. I will say that when we were reaching out to companies initially, what we found was that a lot of companies were already having this conversation on the ground. They were already doing the work. And what we were able to do was to consolidate the conversation into one place so that everybody could have the resources. Everyone could say, oh, you're having this conversation too? Well, let's have it together. So in that sense, it gave cover for individual companies, instead of being siloed into this diversity conversation, it became a question of what are our best practices collectively as an industry. So I think that's been a big catalyst for change as well, is, is realizing that we don't want to be the first one out there. We don't want to be the only ones doing this work. But then looking across the, the country, across the world now, everybody's having this conversation. I mean, the Paris Opera just last month cited us by name as a contributing factor for them no longer doing blackface and yellowface. This is a 352-year-old dance organization, our first professional dance institution that's willing to have this conversation and realizing, yeah, if we want to survive and stay relevant, we've got to do better. Yes, it's been a short amount of time, but I'm optimistic about the future if this trend continues. And What's great is that quite early on in this process, you weren't just acting as the ethics police coming in to look at what a company was doing and respond to it. You're also becoming more and more a proactive creator of work. And that must be really satisfying. I actually have a premiere this December of a new work. I'm reimagining a, a lost 18th century ballet called Ballet de Porcelain. It's about a Chinese magician who turns people into porcelain. It was choreographed as an allegory for when Europe discovered porcelain, the, you know, the secret to making Chinese porcelain. And so it was sort of a celebration of Europe conquering China and Chinese technology. And so I'm working with an all Asian creative team to flip the script on that. So that's premiering in in uh, December, but then also working on these Bayadair and Corsair projects of basically saying, I'm actually quite conservative in terms of history. I'm a dance history nut, and I do want to preserve tradition, but I do think there's a better way to do that that involves people of color, and it means that we have to be creative. It means we have to, you know, there's a game I love to play called, you know, what else could it be? So when you have something that's from the past that is problematic, okay, well, what else could it be? Does it just have to be the coolie? What if it was a grasshopper? What if it was a panda bear? What if it was a cup of tea? Literally a dancing cup of tea. What, what else could it be? And you have to be playful and creative and, and play like, like children. Like we used to, when we were kids, have all sorts of imagination fantasies. And we lose that when we get older. But as creative people, we have to touch that part of ourselves and, and come back to that childlike fantasy in order to reimagine some of these classics. You, you, you have to be able to play with it a little bit. So that's been you know, something that I'm hoping that others will, will follow as well. I feel that we've covered quite a lot of ground in quite a short time. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a bit of a canter, but thank you very much. I am going to stop and let you go. But I can't do that without asking the one final question, which is, Phil, why does dance matter to you? I think I came to dance at a young age when I was processing a lot of things, a lot of external things, and I wasn't quite sure how to put into words what was happening. 
and dance really was a way for me to find strength, find myself, find healing, be empowered. And that I think in many ways, dance has saved my life and made a life for me. And so if I can share that with other people, uh, you know, that's, that's something that I think is, is really beautiful and, and probably the biggest thing that I can do just to make sure that other people have this outlet and have this source of strength as well. Yeah, pass, passing it on and paying it forward. Perfect. Thank you so much, Phil. It's been really Thank you, David. fascinating. Thank you. Before I spoke to Phil, I wondered why he persisted with ballet and its problematic culture. Why not walk away from it? But listening to him, I get it. He reminds us that change is overdue, but it is possible. What do you think? Is ballet fit for the 21st century? Let me know. I'm at Mr David Jays on Twitter and the RAD is at RAD Headquarters. And our show notes have information about the RAD's work, Phil's work with Final Bow for Yellowface and his symposium for the RAD on the 19th of July, which is open to everyone. And please do subscribe and like the podcast so that it makes its way to other people who might enjoy Why Dance Matters. Our guest today was Phil Chan. Why Dance Matters is made by the RAD team of Hayley Izzard, Celia Moran and Melanie Murphy. Our artwork is by Bex Glendinning and our ace producer is Sarah Miles. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon.